Good morning, Tiffany and Zachary. We'll get started here in about uh, about 10 minutes. Thanks for your patience.
Uh, good morning, everybody. We'll get started in about three minutes. Uh, thanks for your patience. All right, everybody, uh, thanks for joining in this morning. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Now, uh, will somebody kindly unmute and let me know if you're seeing? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, it's been a minute since we've been together. Uh, in this, you know, Zoom uh, session because um, of holidays and exams and uh, so on and so forth. I just want you guys to know that um, I will be um, scoring your midterm exams this week, uh, probably this weekend, to be honest. Uh, and um, <clears throat> then we can talk about, you know, what what happens um, once I get them scored, if you have any kinds of questions, okay? So just so you're aware of that, uh, I haven't scored them yet. So uh, just be on the lookout for that to happen here um, in the next several days, okay? So I'm gonna go right into the weekly overviews. And <clears throat> um, I, I did go in and make, you know, some adjustments to the schedule, if I'm, if I recall correctly, to kind of, um, you know, free you up a little bit um, during the midterm week, you know, not have us meeting, not having assignments due outside of the midterm and, and so on, so that you could, you know, give best effort on the exam. But that does mean, you know, that I had to somewhere down the line kind of, kind of pick up some of the slack um, on, on that whole, um, you know, in our schedule. And uh, I, I actually thought about combining weeks nine and 10 um, and kind of spreading out things over this week and next week dealing with Newton's laws. But then I thought about it, you know, maybe some of you really need some time to focus on finding a project article. 
So, you know, I, 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 I tried to manage things to give you that opportunity if you hadn't done so already. For those of you who've already got your article approved, you're sitting, you know, you're, you're, really, um, you're really in a good position at this point. Um, and, and I will talk more about, you know, kind of give you one more opportunity to, to get a feel for this project if you hadn't uh, jumped into it already. I'll do that next Tuesday um, so that, you know, you have, have some good details and information to guide you through uh, next Saturday, not this Saturday, next Saturday, because that's when your project article is due. But in the meantime, there is some really good information in the announcements. Uh, and I, I've talked about the project before in some of the in some of our class meeting videos. So uh, you do have some things available to you to guide you. And of course, you can always go and look at the project information. Um, if you click on the project article link that you see there in week nine, uh, you know, there's there's a way you can, you know, get directly to the project there if you choose to or if you click on the assignments and activities left menu, there's a, a link to the project as well. So, um, you know, if you hadn't taken a look and you want to before I talk about it again, uh, feel free to take advantage of those, um, you know, resources and access. All right. Um, so, we, yes. So all, all nine of the assignments are due this Saturday, just double checking, correct? Nine assignments yes um, well, nine assignments uh yeah nine. You set five and a discussion you have three different ps assignments due for saturday and like a bunch of discussions yeah yeah, yeah. so you yeah you will have uh, two labs four discussions oh i'm not talking three about problem this, sets this for lecture class right and uh you know, so yeah, you have a couple of things on your plate, but you know, I could go back and push some of it further down, but it only means that at some point you're going to have to have a lot of things do. And I figured, um, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to be so crammed with, um, you know, really is starting to be crunch time where the project is concerned. So I yeah, mean, it's just hard because I have a bunch of other midterms this week also. Yeah. Top of class. So. But, yeah, um, I mean, I could do that, you know, if, if that's what the class wants, I could, I could kind of take, uh, you know, I could move the momentum down to uh, cover it with the work and energy since those two topics kind of really, they work kind of hand in hand, if you will. And I could take the gravitation overview and put it starting in week nine. And so that means you would only have to deal with Newton's laws and, you know, whatever is related to that for this week would that help out you could just make it optional like the due date could be like over a week span uh yeah i typically don't like to do that i mean i get enough folk with optional issues as it <laughs> as it stands um but i like to have some firm deadlines so that people know exactly you know what the expectation is now i don't mind um, kind of revamping the schedule a little bit to give you a little bit more time, but assigning a, a firm due date, but to say the deadline is flexible, I, I, I typically don't operate that way because that flexible comes in on a case by case basis if something's really going wrong in your life, but I don't, I don't, I don't like to do that for the entire class, but I am open to, you know, a rearranging weeks eight, nine, and 10 so that you know, you do have some more time this week, especially if you're trying to deal with midterms. Uh, so you have to let me know while we're here together today, if that's something you want me to do. And I'll take my cues from the folk that are here. If the folk that aren't here, they'll just have to, you know, get with the program, so to speak. So you tell me what you want to do. I mean, I'm okay with you doing that as long as the rest of the class is okay with it. That's I mean, I'm okay with it. Yeah. This week's midterms week, so. Yeah, okay. Well, here's what we'll do then. We'll just plan for covering the material on Newton's Laws. You'll have problem set five due, uh, Newton's Laws discussion due, and you ha you'll have a fir your bo first bonus opportunity that I'll talk about. And then everything else will just get, you know, rearranged, okay? So you'll have to give me a day or so to make those changes, but, you know, you're here and you know 
that I'm going to adjust the schedule. Now, I will say this. There is nothing in the world that prevents anybody from working ahead if, if you choose to, even once I redo the schedule, right? I mean, if you want to say, okay, yeah, I know, I, I just, she revamped the schedule. I only have this Newton's Laws overview stuff to get through this week along with my midterms. But hey, you know, once I get that off my plate, I'm going to start working ahead so that I don't have so much, um, you know, in the future. Because I'll be honest with you, after I make this schedule adjustment, it's probably going to not be to your advantage for me to have to change things again unless something drastic beyond our control happens because of the fact that, um, you know, after midterm, things just start to go really fast. And if I kind of start cramming more things in, that'll just make your life more hectic, right? So let me make this, uh, this adjustment. I'll move the momentum overview down to um, week 10. I'll take the gravitation overview and move it to week nine. And that way you'll have, um, you know, a, a, a lighter load for this week. Okay. So stay tuned for those changes. All right. Thank you. So, yeah, no problem. Um, well, you know, you had my midterm last week. So it's kind of like, um, you know, I, I forget as an adjunct that you guys are actually doing other people's classes and they may not be following the it may be following a little bit different schedule. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Uh, I want you to do well on everything, my class and all of your other classes as well. So um, I appreciate you letting me know. So, um, well, let's go back to the objectives now that we got that all kind of worked out. So this week, we're gonna be starting our um, study of Newton's laws. And I say this week we're starting because actually the gravitation stuff that I'm going to push out to next week also um, kind of it, it connects to Newton's laws. In fact, Newton was instrumental in dealing with, you know, these laws that we're going to stand related to motion, as well as gravitation that we'll be looking at next week. So um, you can see here that one of the primary areas that Newton's laws helps us to deal with just by looking at the objectives is force. So we're at the point now where we can start to talk about this whole force business. How do, how do forces influence motion? And then, um, you know, how do Newton's laws help us to understand forces and how they influence motion, right? Um, and, and so you can kind of see that we're going to be looking at his, the three laws of motion here. We're going to, um, you know, of course, anything we deal with here, we have to get, you know, comfortable with the various formulas and, and that relate to those laws and, and, and help us to understand, um, you know, from a quantitative perspective, how, how our physical environment is working. Because that's, you know, that's, that's the real crux of this course, right? How, how, do, how does our physical environment work? And so we wanna investigate the aspect of forces as they pertain to our physical environment. And Newton's laws help us to really do that, okay? So that's why we're going with this whole thing. And of course, we just kind of looked at the things you have on your plate. Now, I will say to you, problem set number five actually deals with the 2D motion stuff that you've already covered. Because remember, problem sets are behind. So you've already got 2D motion under your belt where we talked about projectiles and circular motion, right? And so this problem set um, relates to that, um, to, to that topic. Um, you do have a discussion on our current topic, Newton's laws. And then um, I'll talk about your first bonus. Uh, I, let, let me save that for Thursday and get through you know, the bulk of this material on Newton's laws today. Uh, somebody's unmuted. Did you have a question for me? I can't hear you. Okay, I heard, I thought I heard somebody trying to ask a question. If you, if that's not working for you, you can, um, always post your comments in the chat. I, in fact, I see something from Nikki. I did not comment on two of my discussions. Can I go back? Not at this point. 
um, you know, you can't go back. I, I kind of left things open for quite a bit of time for folk, um, but now, you know, whatever's, whatever, the, whatever deadlines are passed, um, that those things are closed, right? Okay. So um, here's, you know, all of the resources that you have access to regarding, uh, regarding Newton's laws. Uh, chapter five that comes uh, from the CK12 textbook. You should be you should be looking at that material. I have some nice videos on Newton's laws that are available to you. And then, of course, you know the supplemental notes. Those are those are my uh, notes. And and what will happen on Thursday is that um, I'll talk about the next bonus. No, I mean your first bonus. Excuse me. And then I will also um, go into our extra notes resources. And, um, and, and, you know, look at some sample problems that you should be able to do utilizing Newton's uh, laws, okay? So, you know, as always, I'm trying, uh, you know, you need to be reminded that, you know, the way you get better at this stuff is to be engaged with this stuff, right? You have to be reviewing your notes, working practice problems, engaging in discussions, asking questions when you have them. Uh, it's too late after the midterm to ask me questions ab about the stuff that you needed to know for the midterm. You should be asking me prior to, right? Um, because um, after the fact, does you know that doesn't benefit you much, right? All right, so you can see here again, um, you know, the objectives that I pull right from from the Canvas page and. You know, and, and how they fall into play in, in terms of this packet. So, if you recall, up to now, we've been dealing with things from a kinematics perspective. You know, that's a very important word, if you recall, because that word kinematics means motion. And that kinematics means pure motion, right? Motion without respect to cause. And so when we're deal, dealing with kinematics, we look at things like displacement, velocity, acceleration, distance, speed, time, right? But uh, we need to be getting into looking at the, the, what is responsible for the motion because that's not part of kinematics, okay? Um, when you get into dynamics, that's when you start to look at the factors that cause and control the motion of objects, right? And so what we're doing now is we're adding another layer of complex complexity. <coughs> I mean, you know, if you think about all the different types of motion we've studied, horizontal motion, vertical free fall motion, 2D projectile motion, 2D circular motion, but nowhere in there did we talk about the causes for motion. So now we got to add that piece to the puzzle, okay? And that does add another layer of complexity. And I always tell students, this is, we're starting to really get to the point where the rubber meets the road in terms of what it is you should be getting from this course, okay? Because now we're helping to build a more complete picture of motion because we're embracing the causes. Okay, and some of the most important concepts when we deal with dynamics and look at the causes and control, you know, of motion, we, we look at force, mass, and inertia. We, we hadn't dealt with forces at all um, in terms of looking at motion. We've talked about mass before, but, but strictly as a property that, um, you know, that is one of the fundamental properties when we talked about measurement, but we hadn't really used it for anything other than that. Now it's, we're gonna see what is this mass stuff useful for in terms of motion, okay? And then uh, an, another property that's really closely re related to mass and force, inertia. We'll see what what is that, what role does it play, okay? and. Uh, I think, you know, I've kind of harped on this once before when we started just looking at um, the nature of science and, you know, the important people who helped to 
uh, establish the knowledge that we have, you know, early knowledge that we have regarding uh, physical science and motion. We can see here again stated that uh, Galileo and um, Newton were like two of the big giants, right? Um, Galileo um, really took us to a level of trying to look at things from an experimental perspective. And then Newton comes along and he takes the work that Galileo did and formulates it into these laws of motion that we're utilizing as part of our study of dynamics, okay? You know, I always found it very interesting that if you notice Galileo, you know, one of the primary folk who helped us to understand motion dies in 1642. And that same year, Newton, the guy that would pick up his torch and carry it forward was born in 1642. So um, it's, it's not, you know, wasted time to kind of give credit to to Isaac Newton for his genius. I mean, I, I have to say that honestly, he's, prob he's probably one of the premier genu genius geniuses in all of human history in terms of helping us to understand how our physical environment works. Um, and, and, you know, his work goes well beyond our understanding of motion. He was very interested in light. Um, you can see here that he invented the reflecting um, telescope um, and um, even um, developed a whole branch of mathematics called calculus. Uh, Isaac Newton and uh, Leibniz are the two primary individuals who developed calculus. And Newton was interested in this math because he needed it to help describe moving objects. This whole idea of rates, you know, um, they needed the mathematical tools to help understand rates because motion is, is, is about rates. And so he invented the math that he needed to, to, to do that study. That, that is like, whoa, okay. I mean, how many people, you know, can say that they invented math, <laughs> but, he, he's that guy. And then, you know, in terms of his uh, work where emotion is concerned, um, you think about all the things that are moving on a regular basis. And, you know, especially in our macroscopic or large scale world. And we wouldn't be able to describe or understand that without his work. So that's pretty groundbreaking, pretty incredible. So um, force, so as we said that force is one of the key uh, properties that we need to understand. Remember when I say the word property, I'm talking about something in our physical environment that we can measure, right? So this property force is important when we wanna understand motion. Now, we don't have to dig too deep to, to understand that because I mean, you've had your own experiences with force, okay? I mean, you've moved things, you push things, you pull things, and so are seen things being pushed and pulled on, right? Um, and, and so this idea of force is not foreign. I always say, you know, a simple definition of force is a push or a pull. And now when you break it down to that level, you have to understand then that this force is a vector, right? Because if you're pushing or pulling, direction is involved, okay? And so, you know, your understanding of vectors is, is critical at this point um, because it, you know, it, it gives clarity to this idea of a force, okay? And, and again, you know, you, you have your own intuitive experiences, you know, you know, for example, as they state here, you know, if you push uh, harder on a, a wheelbarrow, for example, you can make it move. And then if you put, keep pushing harder, you can make it move faster, right? So that's not a foreign concept. And I always tell students, uh, don't convolute or make this whole idea of forces more difficult than it needs to be. 
keep the uh, keep your you know your your intuitive experience right on the table with you okay you see the brilliance of Isaac Newton is that he took that intuitive understanding and he helped to put it in mathematical terms I always tell folks Newton is brilliant because he helped us to understand that books don't jump off tables right and you think about it if you put a book on a table it doesn't just spontaneously jump off the table all by itself and we've probably known that kind of thing since human beings have been around but Newton is brilliant because he put the math to it okay so um you know with this with our understanding of dynamics, uh, we can explain the motion of objects um, because we understand the forces acting on them, okay? And so again, as it states here, you know, remember every force has a magnitude and a direction. Magnitude meaning the size, how much, and then which direction. Put those two together and you can understand force, okay? Um, don't worry about that bold business that they're talking about, except that, you know, sometimes if you're reading a book or something, they express vectors with this bold um, type so that you know they're talking about a vector. But you should know if we're talking about a vector because any property that we can measure that has direction involved is a vector. Okay. Um, this is another important concept when utilizing forces as vectors. Uh, we need to understand some language here, right? Um, so we can add vectors. If, if two forces are pushing at an object, we can add those forces together to see how they impact the motion, okay? So when we have multiple forces acting on an object, we can, um, we can add those forces to get what we call a resultant force or in Newton's language, the net force. Now let's understand this word net. Let me break it down to you in kind of some simplistic terms. Um, you know, I'm not sure, but I suspect that um, many of you have jobs and have worked a job before, or you know somebody who has right? Meaning they get a paycheck, right? And if you look at your paycheck, you have what's called the gross amount, which represents everything that you earned. And then you have the net amount, which represents the amount that's left over after they take out everything, right? So that idea of net, meaning what's left, what's the result after you combine things, right? So that's what we mean when we say net force. What is the force that's left over after we add up all the forces acting on the object, okay? So we call that, you can see two terms sometimes, the resultant force or the net force, okay? And, and it's important to understand this net force because that's the one that really can produce changes in motion, and we'll see that, okay? Um, this idea of internal and external forces, we don't get into internal forces here, so we don't need to worry about that. We're only concerned with external forces because they are the ones acting outside and upon an object, okay? So we're interested in the forces that are acting on an object from outside not the forces acting on the object from the inside. That's why I said we don't get down to the molecular level in here. We don't do chemistry because that does involve internal forces. We're concerned with outside forces acting on an object, okay? So see some terminology there, net force, external force. Those two concepts are very important because that's what Newton uses to build this mathematical description. Okay, free body diagrams. So we, you know, a lot of times in, in physical science and physics, it's very useful to have pictures to help us kind of digest what's going on. 
And so a free body diagram is you know, a, a, a picture that can help us to clarify the forces acting on an object so that we can kind of get a sense of what our net force is, okay? So it's a, it's a drawing that helps us to do that, clarify the forces acting on an object, okay? It's, it's kind of a sketch. You see an example on the right, okay? Now, some, some things about drawing a free body diagram that you need to understand. For example, you see the, the red looking dot on the screen, okay? And that red looking dot is our actual object. Now, what, what is this object? It could be a car, could be a person, could be a planet, could be anything. But we can take that object and collapse it down into this dot and then show uh, using our vector arrows, the forces acting on the object. So let's say, for example, this red dot is Mars. And we wanna show forces acting on Mars. We take Mars, that big, huge planet, and we collapse it down into this dot. That's the beauty of a free body diagram. We don't have to worry about the shape of the object or anything like that. We just collapse it down into a dot, and then we show the forces acting on it as they have done here, okay? So in this case, you can see that there's a force one, and it's acting on this object uh, from and pulling it to the right. And then we have this force two acting on this object and is pulling it, you know, up. Okay. And so when we take those two forces and add them together, we get a net force or a resultant force, whichever terminology, um, you know, you want to use there. Okay. They mean the same thing. Okay. So simplicity is the key when doing a free body diagram, okay? All right, so um, Newton developed three laws that helps us to explain and predict. Remember, that's the whole goal of a law, right? It allows us to predict what's gonna happen, okay? Um, and so, um, you know, in this case, the laws help us to predict and explain dynamics of motion. Remember that word dynamics is incorporating what? Forces, right? So they help us to understand and, and explain and predict how forces um, uh, operate as far as motion goes, right? And so, again, he built his understanding based on his own work and observations, you know, you've heard the story about Newton sitting under the apple tree and the apple falls and hits him on the head and knocks him out. And when he wakes up, he says, ah, voila, gravity, right? Well, not, not necessarily, but you know, all of those things went into um, helping him to understand motion as well as the work by two, two big giants in, our, in this area, Galileo and Kepler. And we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about Kepler more when we talk about gravitation next week. All right. So you know you've you've often heard people when giving speeches say, you know, if I've been able to do anything, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Right. Well, that quote actually comes from Newton. You know, so when you say hear people say it, I was standing on the shoulders of giants. You should say, oh. That's Isaac Newton's quote, um, you know, they're borrowing from him. And he, he was humble enough to give credit to Galileo and Kepler for the work that they did that allowed him to do the work that he did, okay? So um, again, we'll look at this, his, his role in dealing with gravity next week. So let's take his first law of motion. And what I like to do is I'll read this first law of motion and then I'll try to get inside of it a bit to try to help you break it down in simpler terms. Okay, did I have a question out there? Okay, I thought I heard somebody unmute. So Newton's first law of motion, a body at rest remains at rest. And when he's saying body here, he's talking about an object, 
okay? A body at rest remains at rest, or if it is in motion, it remains in motion at a constant velocity unless acted upon by a net external force. There are those three magic words, net external force. So we know net means left over. We know external means from the outside. We know force means a push or a pull, right? So now let me take this law and break it down and say it in a different way. An object at rest remains at rest unless acted upon by a net external force. So that's the first part of his first law. An object at rest, think about what that means. At rest means not moving. So an object that is not moving will not move unless it's acted upon by a what? Net external force, right? Let's take the second part of his law. An object that is in motion will remain in motion at a constant velocity unless acted upon by a net external force. So if an object is moving, it will keep moving with the same velocity unless it's acted upon by a net external force. So objects want to do what they've always done. They want to stay at rest or they want to keep moving with the same velocity. How do you change that? With a net external force. Okay. If you don't have a net external force, meaning what? You don't have some force left over after you add up all the forces on this object, then you can't change the object's motion. Meaning if it's at rest, it's gonna stay at rest. If it's moving, it's gonna keep moving with the same velocity, okay? So see, this is kind of where Galileo fell down a bit. Well, let me go back even further. Actually, this is where Aristotle and, and, and folk who were investigating motion even earlier than Galileo got, got it wrong because they thought that an object's natural tendency is to come to a stop. And Newton comes along and said, no, an object's natural tendency is not to come to a stop. An object's natural tendency is to keep doing whatever it's doing. So if it's at rest, it's gonna stay. It wants to stay at rest. If it's moving, it wants to keep moving with the same velocity. And remember, what does velocity mean? speed and direction, right? So if it's moving, it wants to keep the same speed in the same direction. Well, how do you change either of those? If you want it to stop being at rest, you need a net external force acting on it. If you wanted to change the object's constant velocity, you have to act upon it with a net external force. So see, Newton's first law establishes for us what is the criteria needed to change an object's motion? Okay. So that's what Newton's first law is doing for us. It's establishing that there must be a cause in the form of a net external force to change the velocity of an object. Okay. And think about it. If an object is at rest and you change that, it starts moving, you did change its velocity because its velocity was zero and now it's not zero. If it's moving with a constant velocity and you change that, now it's not moving with that constant velocity anymore. So in other words, um, you know, Newton's first law establishes the cause for a change in motion, okay? And think about it. If we change an object's velocity, whether that object is at rest or it has some non-zero constant velocity, you've accelerated the object. So Newton's first law establishes for us what must be present to cause an object to accelerate. And that is a net external force, okay? So it says intuitively, we see that items at rest tend to remain at rest unless we push or pull them, right? On the other hand, a rolling or sliding object only slows down due to friction, okay? So you see, um, that's where some, some of the previ previous scientists got it wrong because they didn't understand friction. 
That's why they thought that the object's natural tendency is to come to, to a stop, which was wrong because they didn't know about friction. Even Galileo and all of his brilliance, he only got part of the picture right when it came to friction, okay? So remember, Newton's first law says, if you want to change an object's state of motion, you need a net external force. What two options do we have for an object's state of motion? Well, one state is that it could be at rest. The other state is that it could be moving with a constant velocity. How do you change either of those? With a net external force, okay? That's how you produce acceleration, okay? So that's a big concept there to be able to put mathematics behind that. So since changing an object's motion is you know, at the crux of Newton's first law, we need to understand, well, hmm, how do you do that? Okay. And that's where this understanding of inertia and mass come into play. And sometimes you'll hear Newton's first law called the law of inertia. And so what is this inertia? Inertia is the tendency of an object to remain at rest or in motion with a constant velocity. So inertia is the tendency of an object to keep doing whatever it's doing. Okay? So, so you know, objects just, you know, have, want to be able to keep doing whatever they're doing. And the inertia lets us know, you know, the capability of an object to do so. And that's why I say some objects have more inertia than others. So the inertia of a large boulder is, you know, um, much more than a tennis ball, for example. Right? Because you think about it, which one is it going to be more difficult to change in terms of motion? The large boulder. And that's why um, that's, you know, that helps us to understand how, how much force are we going to have to apply to move this boulder versus this tennis ball? How much force are we going to have to ex exert to change this object's motion? You're going to need a, a different amount depending upon the inertia of the object. How do we know how much inertia an object has? Mass. Mass is a property that we can measure. And the mass is directly related to inertia. The amount of mass tells us the amount of inertia. Okay. And so, see, that gives us a different perspective of mass uh, compared to when we first looked at it, um, you know, when we're just talking about units, right? Now we know what it means and the role that it plays in terms of motion. More mass, more inertia. More inertia, more difficult to change the object's motion, okay? And of course, by now you know that um, in the metric system or the SI system, uh, we use kilograms in physical science, right? That is our base property or base unit. Um, kilograms, all right? So it says here, objects with greater mass not only possess a greater inertia, but they also apply a greater gravitational force upon other objects. So don't worry about that gravitational stuff at this point, but the more mass, the more inertia, okay? Newton's second law. So now let's get past the first law. The first law says, if you want to produce an acceleration, you have to have a net force. Newton's second law comes along and says, okay, you have a net force. Let's figure out how much acceleration, okay? Newton's first law says, no net force, no acceleration. Newton's second law says, you have a net force, 
how much acceleration can you produce, okay? So Newton's second law is a mathematical statement of this cause and effect relationship between force and changes in motion, all right? So um, this law takes that net external force that we talked about needing and relates it to mass and acceleration. So you see that written as F net equals mass times acceleration. So this net force, remember net means what? This leftover or unbalanced force equals to the mass of the object, which tells us what? The amount of inertia times the object's acceleration, okay? And so you can see from the picture here, if you exert the same amount of force on a basketball or an SUV, the acceleration is gonna be different because what? The mass of the objects is different, right? So same amount of force. So the person in the picture is pushing with the same amount of force. But because the basketball has a smaller mass and less in inertia, it will produce a higher acceleration on the ball. Same amount of force exerted on the SUV because it has a much larger mass inertia will produce a much smaller acceleration, okay? So see what Newton's second law takes us to is calculating you know, the amount of acceleration based on the, the amount of mass and net force that are available, okay? Or you can think of it in a holistic perspective. It looks at the relationship between net force, mass, and acceleration. And we'll look deeper at this uh, relationship, this e equation, this formula, this law on Thursday when we look at some sample problems that utilize this relationship, okay? But, you know, I always tell students, don't, don't just look at this from a, just a math perspective. Look at this formula for what it's really telling you in terms of the relationship between those variables, between those properties that we measure, okay? Um, gravitational force and weight. Now, I know I just, I said earlier, uh, yeah, we'll get deeper into this whole gravity business next week. But we do have some aspect of gravity that we need to uh, delve into um, to, you know, to help us utilize Newton's second law, right? Um, up till now, we've only looked at gravity from the perspective of its acceleration, right? Gravitational acceleration, G, 9.8 meters per second squared down, right? You know, that negative sign tells us what? Down, right? Uh, and, and the value of G is 9.8 meters per second squared on Earth, right? But now we got to look, take that and, and look at it a, from a different perspective. So we got, now we got to look at gravity from the perspective of force. Yes, gravity produces an acceleration, but gravity also um, produces a force on an object, okay? And so we're looking at uh, how we can apply Newton's second law on an object that's on the Earth's surface, okay? And so when we do that, we're talking about an object's weight. So weight is the amount of gravitational force exerted on an object, okay? How do we figure out how much? We take the object's mass, and we multiply times the gravitational acceleration. So remember the negative sign in this formula is just telling us direction. So if we wanna figure out the size of the weight, the amount of weight, we just multiply M times G, okay? You have to always remember though, that's pointing down, okay? And, and, and be mindful here, right? Cause um, an object's mass is, is always going to be the same, but it's that G that can change, right? So mass is an intrinsic property that doesn't change as you move around from place to place in this universe. You know, so your mass is the same on earth 
as it is on Mars, as it is on the moon, as it is you know, on Jupiter, your mass is always the same. But it's your weight that's going to change as you move around because your weight depends on gravity. And gravity is different as you move around from place to place um, you know, in our universe, right? So your, your weight is different on the moon or Mars or Jupiter, okay? So you have to keep that straight, right? So we know that if the acceleration of the object is, is due to gravity alone, that means it's in free fall. We know that. We know if an object is free fall, its acceleration is automatically 9.8 meters per second squared down. That's not a new concept to you, but this idea of using gravity to determine weight, which is a force, that's the new part here. Okay, and of course, if we're going to be looking at things from a um, you know measurement perspective, then we need a unit. And this unit of force, this unit that we use for weight, is the Newton in honor of Isaac Newton, right? So when we are looking at forces, the unit that we need to be utilizing is Newtons because we do things in a metric system. Uh, and since weight is one of the primary forces that we deal with on a regular basis, uh, we need to understand that, you know, its unit is Newtons, okay? All right. So, um, you know, that's really important to, to understand. That, that is about as deep as we're going to get into gravity right now, because we're only concerned with um, an object's weight, you know, on, on Earth or you know, on Mars or the moon. And then, you know, you would need to know the gravitational acceleration there to figure that out. And we'll look deeper into that uh, as well. Newton's third law. So Newton's third law deals with the symmetry of forces. Um, I like to say that Newton's third law deals with what we call action and reaction pairs, okay? So um, Newton's third law says that Whenever one body exerts a force on a second body. So whenever one object exerts a force on a second object. So you have this object pushing or pulling on another object. It says each body, each object experiences a force that is equal in magnitude, size, amount, but opposite in direction. So, if one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object automatically exerts the same amount of force back, but in the opposite direction. Okay. So it says here, you know, the, the, the primary importance of this third law is that it helps us to understand that forces occur in pairs. Okay. And so we can, we can kind of grasp what Newton's third law is saying here by looking at the picture that they provide. So you can see here the swimmer is exerting a force on the wall with their feet. Their feet are pushing on the wall, right? But Newton's third law says, and even though we don't readily think about it, the wall is exerting a force back on the feet automatically. When the swimmer pushes on the wall, the wall automatically pushes back on the swimmer with the same amount of force. You can see it's the same amount because in the picture, the arrows are the same length. Remember, force is a vector, right? But what you have to be thinking about here is that it is the wall exerting a force on the swimmer's feet that allows the swimmer to accelerate, okay? And you can see from the picture that those two forces, based on the size of the arrow, same size, but pointing in opposite direction, right? So the action force is the wall, I mean, the feet on the wall, the reaction is the wall on the feet. Action, reaction, pairs. Now, what we have to get really comfortable with and really understand well is that these forces are not going to cancel each other out. You might be thinking, well, hey, wait a minute. 
if they're the same size, opposite directions, aren't they balanced? Isn't our net force zero? And the answer here would be no, because they're not acting on the same thing. In order for forces to cancel, according to Newton's first law, they must be equal and opposite, but act on the same object. Here, they don't. The feet are acting on the wall. The wall is acting, reacting back on the feet. So they're not dealing with the same object. So they can't cancel. These action-reaction pairs that Newton is talking about in his third law do not cancel each other out. And you might have heard Newton's third law expressed, for every action, there is an equal but opposite reaction, okay? But you have to remember that even though these forces, this action and reaction are equal and opposite, they don't act on the same object, so they don't cancel, okay? Now, uh, this last, uh, these last few slides kind of talk about some various types of forces that we'll get deeper into when we, we have to solve some problems. Uh, this is kind of like some terminology to help you understand that we kind of categorize forces, right? Um, and so, you know, we, we like to think of forces as simple pushes and pulls, but we can categorize those, things like thrust and lift and drag. Um, weight, we already talked about the force of weight. Friction, right? That's important. Uh, the idea of a normal force and a tension force. We'll talk a little bit more about those as we delve a little deeper into the problem solving process, right? But weight is one of the primary forces that we deal, deal with because, you know, if you think about it, everything on planet Earth that has mass is being pulled on by gravity. And so weight is a very important force. Okay, friction, that's an important force between surfaces that are in contact. We'll look at that a little bit more on Thursday as we talk about problem solving. Normal force, that's, um, that's a special type of force between surfaces. And tension, we typically think of tension as the force that's being transmitted through ropes and cables, strings and things like that, okay? So we'll look at those a little bit closer as they become relevant for problem solving, okay? Um, so uh, yeah, that friction, you know, that, that's one of, besides weight, that's one of the most important forces because um, anytime things touch, there's friction. We'll look at that in a little bit deeper on Thursday. And then those spring forces and restoring forces, we'll save that to later on uh, when we start talking about uh, um, periodic motion and Hooke's law. We'll look at those, the spring force and restoring force uh, later on. So for now, we're gonna focus on weight, friction, and normal force and tension. We'll look at those uh, and, and their role uh, you know, in more detail on Thursday. See, okay. So yeah, we'll come back to this and take a look at that um, on, on Thursday. Um, and, and finish up this packet, and then we'll get to looking at some sample problems, and I'll talk about your, your, um, your first bonus. So what I want to do now is just, uh, you know, I'll leave my screen up, but anybody who has questions, uh, please feel free uh, to unmute and ask your question. We have, you know, maybe 15 minutes or so, um, but I want to give you a chance to answer, to ask any questions that you might have. All right. So um, if you don't have any questions for me, we're all done for this morning. I appreciate you joining in and uh, giving your attention to this material. Uh, I'll see you back here uh, on Thursday at uh, 10 o'clock.